Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly Young from the Miami University Alumni Association. Today, on the 100th anniversary of the ratification, we are proud to feature the webinar, Helen Hamilton Gardner and the Secret History of the 19th Amendment. Your instructor today is Dr. Kimberly Hamlin. Dr. Hamlin is an Associate Professor of History and Global and Intercultural Studies here at Miami and is the author of Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner. Free Thinker received support from the National Endowment of the Humanities Public Scholar Award and the Carrie Chapman Cat Prize for Research on Women in Politics. Dr. Hamlin was appointed to the Organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecturer Bureau and regularly speaks at the about the history of women, gender, and sex across the country. She's also a regular contributor to the Washington Post, and her research has been featured on NBR, NPR, and CBC Radio. Dr. Hamlin has also contributed to several PBS documentaries. We are grateful to have Dr. Hamlin with us today. Questions were collected during registration and Dr. Hamlin will address some of those throughout the webinar today. You'll also have the option to ask questions during the webinar by clicking the ask a question button under the presentation. Please note that we may not have time to get to every question. However, Dr. Hamlin has graciously provided her email, Twitter handle and website information that will be shared at the end of the presentation for those interested in following up. Today's webinar will last about an hour, including time for questions and answers. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hamlin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. And thank you, JJ and Michelle and everyone at the Miami University Alumni Association. Um, you know, growing up, my dad, who I think is logged in today, was president of the Ithaca College Alumni Association. So as a young girl, I um, was, I was gonna say dragged to, that sounds a little harsh, but I was had the opportunity to go to so many alumni events. So I have such a warm regard for all the good work that alumni associations do. And so whenever the Miami University Alumni Association calls, I answer. So thanks so much to the Alumni Association and especially to all of you for joining us today on August 18th. 2020, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. I'm really delighted to join you today and to share some of my research and to take your questions. Uh, both in the middle, we'll have a chance for some questions and again at the end. So I'm going to share my screen now to show you some of the images from my research and um, we'll get going with our discussion for today. So what exactly are we marking today on August 18th? Well, today is the 100th anniversary of the time when suffragist Feb Burns sent her young son, Harry, this letter. Harry was a member of the Tennessee State Legislature, and in this letter, Feb Burns urged him to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat and vote for pass it or for ratification when the 19th Amendment came before the Tennessee State Legislature. So at the very last minute, young legislator Harry Byrne did switch his vote from a no to a yes, marking the end of more than three generations of women's activism for the right to vote. The Tennessee ratification certificate was dispatched to Washington, and within the next few days, Secretary of State Bainbridge Colby signed the act into law, making it the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. But the 19th Amendment is an incomplete victory. It did not enfranchise women of color, including Native American women who were not considered citizens until 1924, and it did not enfranchise the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of African-American women in the South. Those women did not gain access to the polls until the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So what exactly are we commemorating today? And what is the best way to mark the centennial of the 19th Amendment? Well, what I would like to suggest to you today is that the best way to mark the suffrage centennial is by continuing the fight for universal voting rights, 
to continue to fight to end the sexual double standard, which is what motivated hundreds of thousands of women to enter reform work in the 19th century, and to center women in the stories that we tell about ourselves as a nation, in our mo monuments, in our museums, and in our textbooks. To explain why I think these things are so important and why I think the history of the 19th Amendment is so vital, I'm going to share my research on a woman named Helen Hamilton Gardner, who helps complicate, nuance, make so much more vital and exciting some of the standard ways that we think about suffrage. Even in 2020, we barely know the story of the suffrage movement. To the extent to which we talk about it at all in our history textbooks, it's still presented as a sidebar showing women like these. This is the 1992 slate of officers of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, but our history textbooks make suffrage seem boring, like it's tangential to the grand narratives of America centering war, labor conflicts, and presidential campaigns. And I wanna suggest that instead, the women's rights movement is central to our nation's history, to who we are as a people. <clears throat> The standard story of suffrage that our history textbooks and museums too often still tell us is that in 1848, women demanded the vote in Seneca Falls, New York, and 75 years or so later, they won the vote in 1920. Suffragists themselves are often presented as boring, nagging women, frowning like these ladies in uncomfortable dresses in black and white pictures. But Helen Hamilton Gardner and countless other women whose names have been lost to history give lie to the standard textbook narrative of suffrage, showing us instead what a vibrant, exciting, revolutionary movement it was, populated by women with passions and rivalries, dreams and hopes, many of which we are still striving for today. Helen Hamilton Gardner's story also reveals the rivalries and drama of the women's rights movement and the extent to which the suffrage movement was about sex and bodily autonomy and the extent to which it was marred by racism. So now you may be wondering, who was Helen Hamilton Gardner? Well, Helen Hamilton Gardner, I believe, is the most fascinating and important suffragist that no one has ever heard of. Her life holds important lessons about the roles that sex and racism played in the history of the 19th Amendment, and she also shows us the importance of historical narrative and memory. Whose stories do we remember? Whose do we forget? And how do the narratives that we tell about ourselves as a nation shape who we are today? These are the questions we're going to think about and consider today, and I very much look forward to discussing them with you. Helen Hamilton Gardner's entry into public life began with a sex scandal. Indeed, the sex scandal marks her birth because before it, she was known as Alice Chenoweth. That was her birth name. Alice Chenoweth was born in 1853 to a slave owning Methodist minister in Winchester, Virginia. Her father made the unpopular and unusual decision to emancipate the people that her family held in bondage, move his family to Indiana, and support, along with all three of her brothers, the Union. This brave decision did not endear Reverend Chenoweth to his Virginia relatives or neighbors, but it did cast him as his youngest daughter's lifelong hero and model of how to, get, how to live a good life. Alice Chenoweth learned from an early age that the thing to do is sacrifice everything for one's beliefs, no matter the cost. And that is precisely what she did. After her father and her three brothers all died prematurely as a result of their Civil War wounds and illnesses, her family lost everything. And so Alice Chenoweth traveled to Cincinnati, Ohio to attend Cincinnati Normal School, which was then the best teacher training school west of the Allegheny Mountains. <clears throat> she did so well in Cincinnati that soon she was hired as a teacher in Sandusky, Ohio. And within a year, she was appointed the principal of the teacher training school there, making her the youngest school principal in Ohio history. And this was an accomplishment she was so proud of her whole life. 
being a teacher was just about the only way that a middle-class white woman could support herself in the 19th century. And Alice Chenoweth had always aimed to be a self-supporting woman. So here at the young age of 23, she, she had attained that goal. And this is where the sex part of our story comes into play. As you can see in this picture, not only was young Alice Chenoweth a remarkable teacher, she was also very beautiful. Her good looks and charm and skill in the classroom brought her to the attention of a man named Charles Smart. Charles Smart was the commissioner of public schools in Ohio. Soon, her neighbors in Sandusky began to comment on the fact that it was odd that Commissioner Smart visited Sandusky so often. Sandusky is not the capital of Ohio. It doesn't have the biggest public school population. Why was Commissioner Smart constantly in Sandusky? Well, you can see where this story is going. Soon these whispers began to escalate as it came to light that Commissioner Smart was in town to visit the young school principal. This is the Widow Melville's house in Sandusky where young Alice Chenoweth boarded. She had the misfortune uh, to board in this house along with the brother and sister-in-law of the man who edited the Sandusky Daily Paper. So it didn't take long for these rumors about her um, visitor, Charles Smart, to make their way into the newspapers. Throughout the spring and summer and fall of 1876, newspapers across Ohio carried the salacious story of the young teacher's affair with the commissioner of public schools who was a married father of two. By October, papers even began to print her name, as you can see here in this highlighted section. Now Alice Chenoweth was a fallen woman. This is the 19th century term to describe a woman who had had sex before marriage and been found out. The traditional story of the fallen woman told in so many cautionary tales, newspaper and magazine stories and novels is that this would be the end of a woman's life. What man would marry a fallen woman? Who would hire a fallen woman? Typically the story ends with the fallen woman turning to a life of prostitution and dying in you know, shame and a sad ending. But Helen Hamilton Gardner said, this is not for me. Instead, she moved to New York City and she changed her name from Alice Chenoweth to Helen Hamilton Gardner. In between these, the, her change of name and her move to New York City, she thought deeply about the sexual double standard. She wondered why was her fate so different than Charles Smart's? Why did she suffer such great costs when he carried on in his life as if nothing had happened? He had told her that he was divorced in an attempt to seduce her. She believed him. And for that, she was discharged from her job and run out of town. She began to see that the sexual double standard was really one of the root causes of women's oppression. And this is a quote from her from her first novel that she wrote in 1890. So this sex scandal is really what propels her into a life of public reform. When she moved to New York City, she changed her name to Helen Hamilton Gardner and made no mention of her affair, yet it continued to percolate in her thoughts, to animate her writings, and to give reason for her lifetime of reform. This is a picture of her from when she first entered public life on the Free Thought Lecture Circuit. So as soon as she moved to New York City, she began speaking out in public forums, and she was known as Ingersoll in Soprano, after the most famous speaker of the 19th century, Robert Ingersoll. Here she talked about the sexual double standard, and she wondered how it had come to be seen as natural and normal, and she said that she believed the Bible was the place that taught that women were naturally inferior to men and should be held to such different standards when it came to morality. So she began to speak out against the Bible, and her, her unconventional speeches and views were so radical and so interesting that they made headlines across the nation. Soon, she was one of the most well-known and sought-after speakers and writers in America. This is a picture of the Women's Building at the, 19, at the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago, where millions and millions of Americans ventured to check out the wonders of the world. Nearly 40% of the U.S. population went to this World's Fair. And Helen Hamilton Gardner delivered more speeches than any other American woman at the World's Fair. 
The papers reported that wherever she was speaking, crowds were lined up outside the door. Some even reported that people would have to bribe the police officers to be let into these overcrowded rooms to hear her speak. The New York Sun reported that next to Susan B. Anthony, Helen Hamilton Gardner created the profoundest sensation. Again, she didn't mention her earlier sex scandal because this was in the 19th century when you could change your name and move to a new city and no one could Google you and figure out uh, your secret past. But the sex scandal was what motivated her, what prompted her to ask questions about women's role in life. Soon, she began to hone in on the singular issue that she would devote the next 10 years of her life to. And that is raising the age of sexual consent for girls. Here, I want you to listen closely to me because you're not going to believe what I'm about to say. And that is, in 1890, the age of sexual consent for girls was 12 or younger in 38 states. In Delaware, it was seven. That means a girl as young as seven, 10, 12 was considered legally capable of consenting to sex with a grown man. For these young women, what happened afterwards was usually they would have to enter prostitution. So many reformers like Gardner thought that raising the age of consent would be one way to eradicate some of the ills of the sexual double standard. To illustrate just how painful, how um, ravaging the sexual double standard was for women, Gardner turned to fiction and she published these two novels, which were bold and unusual for the time in their frank descriptions of sexual assault and what it meant for the young women who had endured it. For these novels, she became known as the Harriet Beecher Stowe of fallen women. Her goal was to, to engage a complacent public in this issue, which she succeeded in doing. In 1895, Helen Hamilton Gardner moved to Boston to edit a magazine called The Arena. And she turned The Arena into a single issue publication dedicated to raising the age of sexual consent for girls. This is just one picture from the many editions that she covered um, in, in The Arena on this issue. She joined forces with an unlikely ally in this effort, Frances Willard, the president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. As a free thinker, Gardner did not have much in common uh, with the Christian Frances Willard, but they joined forces to raise the age of sexual consent for girls. Because as Frances Willard said, the Siamese twins of vice are strong drink and the degradation of women. Soon what the temperance advocates and women like Gardner learned was that it was so hard, in many cases impossible, to get male legislators' attention, even on an issue that seemed so abhorrent and so wrong. They were struck throughout the 1880s and 1890s at how often they were rebuffed by male legislators, by how often male legislators inserted mocking language into their proposed bills to raise the age of consent. And so women like Gardner and the 200,000 members of the Women's Christian Temperance Union decided that what women really needed was the vote. This is what brought temperance advocates into the suffrage movement was their thwarted attempts uh, to raise the age of sexual consent for girls. To give you just one example of the clear links between this campaign and women voting and women's entry into politics, I'm just gonna tell you briefly about Representative Carrie Holly of Colorado. She was elected to the Colorado State Legislature the year after Colorado enfranchised women, and she has the distinction of introducing the very first piece of legislation ever proposed by a woman in the United States. What do you think her bill was? Well, you can probably already guess. She proposed that Colorado raise the age of sexual consent for girls all the way to 21, which matched the other ages for property ownership and things like that in the state. Colorado ended up raising the age to 18, which women reformers counted as a huge victory. And they then soon noted that the only other states where they succeeded in raising the age of consent all the way to 18 were Wyoming and Kansas, two other states in which women already had the vote. So these links between women voting, women having a voice in politics, and women being able to control what happened to their own bodies really stood out to women as a prime motivating factor in demanding the vote. And again, Gardner helped lead this charge in large part because of her personal experiences 
uh, with the sexual double standard. So this concludes uh, part one of my talk, the sex portion of my talk. So I'm gonna pause here for a minute and stop sharing my screen and see what questions or comments we have so far. Okay, well, we do have a couple questions that came in um, thus far. Um, the first question is from Nancy, and she asked, how long did it take you to research and write this book about Helen Hamilton Gardner? Nancy, that's a great question, and it depends um, when you consider I started. So I first learned about Helen Hamilton Gardner when I was working on my dissertation at the University of Texas in Austin, so like 2004, 2005. This dissertation um, examined how women used science for feminist purposes in the 19th century. And Gardner was one of my case studies because um, I didn't talk about this today, but in between her free thought work and her sex reform work, she entered science. A big um, debate in the 19th century was over women going to college. Gardner, like many other women, desperately wanted to go to college. Gardner applied to Columbia when she moved to New York in the early 1880s and was refused for being a woman. So she began to investigate the reasons that women were told they couldn't go to college. Prime among these reasons was that women's brains were naturally inferior to men's. William Hammond, who had been the Surgeon General for the Union during the Civil War and later went on to found the American Neurological Association, made it sort of his uh, life's mission to prove that women's brains were naturally inferior to men's. Hammond claimed that he had found 19 distinct ways in which women's brains were inferior. And so Gardner, who, again, is not a trained scientist at this point because she wasn't allowed to be, but she's a bold um, free thinker and a woman who does not take no for an answer. So she took Hammond on in the pages of a magazine called Popular Science Monthly, conducting her own research, disproving his biased claims about women's brains. And then when she died in 1925, she donated her own brain to science. So if you look at my Twitter feed today, I posted a, a selfie of me um, with HHG's brain where it remains today at Cornell. So that's how I first learned about her. Um, and then over the years, I just became more and more fascinated with her. And then thank you uh, to Miami and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I had a research leave um, starting in 2017 that enabled me to finish this book in time for the suffrage centennial. That is pretty fascinating, <laughs> especially the brain part at Cornell. Um, and this is from Regina, and this may also be something that you address in the second half. Um, but she says, on this, the centennial anniversary since women won the right to vote, what work remains unfinished? And what do you wish women knew as they cast their ballots in this election? I think the main, there's so many things I think that remain unfinished, but um, one is universal voting rights. I think over the past several years, um, especially since 2013, the Supreme Court decision Shelby v. Holder, which dismantled key provisions of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. We've seen an unprecedented, in my lifetime anyway, um, attack on voting rights and voting access. Um, so I think that is a main issue that we need to be talking about. I know many of you have read and followed, you know, work like Michelle Alexander, the new Jim Crow, or Brian Stevenson, Just Mercy. And so you know that in many ways, mass incarceration is the new slavery, and a result of mass incarceration is also disfranchisement, right? Because in so many states, felons, even parolees, are disfranchised. So you may have seen today, for example, that President Trump pardoned Susan B. Anthony for voting in 1872. And what I think is that if we really wanted to honor the suffrage centennial, we should pardon women like Crystal Mason in Texas, who is currently serving a five-year sentence for accidentally casting a fraudulent vote while on parole in 2016. So I wish that women knew about the role that race played in the suffrage movement. That's what we're gonna talk about in the second part today. And also that we talk more about voting rights and voting access, especially as we approach the 2020 election during a pandemic when these issues are really top of mind for so many of us. Perfect. Okay, so those were the those were the top two that came in. Okay. So I'll let you carry it away on right. the second half and okay. um, we'll take questions at the end. Okay, great. Thanks. And again, please do um, 
contribute with your questions. I look forward to the next segment of our discussion. I'm just calling up my PowerPoint. Um, there. Okay, great. I'm going to skip over many um, fascinating elements of Helen Hamilton Gardner's life, including the ongoing uh, ramifications of her scandalous love affair with Charles Smart, who she claimed uh, for 25 years was her husband, and he really was not, and he died in 1901, and Helen Hamilton Gardner then reinvents once more. She marries Colonel Selden Allen Day, who you see here. And he was a revered Civil War hero and career army officer. He was revered by his fellow Unionists and Confederates alike because one of Day's jobs had been to guard the cell of Confederate President Jefferson Davis at Fort Monroe. Jefferson Davis's wife, Verena, wrote in her memoir that Colonel Day had been kind to her husband, that he brought him a rocking chair and books to read. And so this endeared him to Confederates. And this is a huge part of our story because um, you will see that when we get to Washington in the teens, who is in charge of everything in Washington? Civil War veterans, their sons and nephews. So the fact that Gardner marries this Civil War hero plays an important role in the 19th Amendment's trajectory. First, I just want to tell you a couple of other things, um, and that is after they got married, they traveled the world for five years and had so many wonderful adventures. Gardner took over a thousand pictures, um, and this is one of them of her riding a camel across the deserts of Egypt to tour the pyramids. So she reinvents herself again after the death of her lover, lover, Charles Smart, goes on this worldwide tour. And then in 1910, Colonel and Mrs. Day settle in Washington, D.C. at this house, 1838 Lamont Street. Here in Washington, Helen Hamilton Gardner joins forces with the suffrage movement. She had previously spoken at some of their conferences. She had been best friends with Elizabeth Cady Stanton before Stanton died in 1902. But Gardner was a little too radical for the suffragists in the 19th century. She had never joined the suffrage organization and she didn't consider suffrage, you know, her top cause. But this changes when she moves to Washington in 1910. This house in Washington also plays an important role in her trajectory and that of the 19th Amendment. She lived right next door to Representative James Beauchamp Champ Clark, the Speaker of the House of Representatives. Gardner had a legendary personal charm, a legendary charisma, and she was also very politically savvy. Soon, her colleagues in the National American Woman Suffrage Association, which is called NASAW for short, soon they came to rely on Gardner as their most efficient volunteer in Washington. The suffragists had long, long, long sought these sorts of insider connections that Gardner provided, not just because she lived next door to the Speaker of the House, but also because she could use her husband's address book, chock full of men in power in Washington from both political parties and from all regions. And that is precisely what Gardner did. Her first main um, task is working side by side with Alice Paul, pictured here, to plan and orchestrate the 1913 suffrage march to coincide with the first inauguration of Woodrow Wilson. Gardner's two jobs were to secure all the permits, which was a huge task at first. Everywhere they went, uh, from the DC police to members of Congress, the answer was no, 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 no. The women wanted to walk along Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol to the White House, and they were told, no, no, why don't you go to 16th Street? It's a lovely shopping street, more appropriate for women. But Gardner used her charm and her contacts to secure all the permits, which was a huge feat. And then she also ran the press operation. Alice Paul raved about Gardner's genius with media for the rest of her life. This was the first time that the suffragists garnered positive national media attention. 
The parade resulted in more than 5,000 women from all across the country and around the world assembling in Washington to demand a federal amendment in franchising women. You can see here they also attracted thousands of protesters uh, and especially drunken men who disrupted the parade and helped make the woman's point for them that men could not legislate on behalf of women. I wanted to highlight this parade because it also shows us the important rifts that we see around race. As you may have heard, one of the main kind of lingering memories we have of this parade is that African-American women were not included alongside white women. Gardner and Alice Paul believed that having an integrated parade in Washington, D.C. in 1912, um, both the Houses of Congress and the White House were controlled by Southern Democrats. So Gardner argued that D.C. was essentially a Southern city in the teens, as indeed it was. So they believed having a fully integrated parade would not um, show well for the cause of suffrage, would lead many people to not support the amendment. So Alice Paul cold shouldered all the African-American women who came to the campaign headquarters asking to march. Nevertheless, dozens of African-American women, including Ida B. Wells, did march alongside white women in this 1913 parade. But you can see here, this rift of race and racism really sets the tone and the trajectory for the 19th Amendment. After the parade, Alice Paul and Helen Hamilton Gardner come to loathe each other. And we can talk more about this in the questions. This is one of the great rivalries of the suffrage movement. And they were fighting over primacy in DC. Who would be the suffragist lead negotiator in Washington? Alice Paul um, was much younger and more brash. She wanted to protest the president. She wanted to take to the streets. Helen Hamilton Gardner was also a firebrand, as you know from part one of the talk, but she was very polished and very charming. She wanted to work behind the scenes with her address book. Who would win? We'll see. Nassau preferred Helen Hamilton Gardner's strategy. So Alice Paul splits with Nassau after the parade and Helen Hamilton Gardner becomes Nassau. They called her their diplomatic corps. She was their lead negotiator in the nation's capital to Washington, uh, to Congress, excuse me, and also to the Wilson White House. And here I wanna give you some examples of how she worked her connections and her personal charm on behalf of the 19th Amendment with President Woodrow Wilson, who had been a supporter of women's voting, but only on a state-by-state -state basis, not the federal amendment. This is a picture of the first time, the first letter that Gardner sent to the White House. She sent it because she had gone on vacation and come back to town to learn that Alice Paul had really stepped up her heckling, she called it, of the president. Alice Paul was not yet protesting at the White House, but she and her followers in the National Women's Party had started interrupting the president's speeches, and they had vowed to work against all Democrats, because that was the party in power, to work against all Democrats up for re-election um, in order to show the strength of the women's movement. Helen Hamilton Gardner thought this was the wrong way to go. So she reaches out, not to Wilson, but to his chief of staff, Tumulti, and she says, you know, I've just come back from vacation and I've learned what Alice Paul is up to. And I know you've never heard of me, but here's a list of my references, all of my friends in Congress. Here's my calling card. Here's a letterhead. And I want you to know, to Malti, she says, that Alice Paul does not speak for the real suffragists of America. The real suffragists of America, she said, are me and my colleagues in NASA. We are nonpartisan. We will not heckle the president. We will work with you colleague to colleague to get the 19th Amendment passed and ratified. Then she does something super clever. She includes this handwritten PS saying, is there a day when Mrs. Wilson sees visitors? Surprisingly, this is something no one else had thought of yet. Reach out to the First Lady. The First Lady did not support the federal suffrage amendment, but like Helen Hamilton Gardner, she was a daughter of a first family of Virginia, and she was also spunky. Edith Wilson was the first woman in Washington to drive a car. So Gardner forges a relationship with Edith Wilson. The next item in Woodrow Wilson's papers and next to this letter is a scrap of paper that says, okay, tomorrow, 1030. So the very next day, Helen Hamilton Gardner's in the White House charming Mrs. Wilson. And from there, she and the members of NASA have a regular in to the Wilson White House. 
several days after Gardner sent this first note to Tumulty, Nassau leaders requested to meet with President Wilson. And you can see here, this is in his own handwriting. He says, are these ladies of the Congressional Union variety? And now this really struck me because now Wilson's been in office for three years already, and he still has no idea who is who, which suffragist is which, and or even that there's different factions. So Tumulty shows Wilson the memo that Gardner wrote, delineating the differences between NASA and the NWP. And then you can see right below, Wilson writes, okay, great. I'll meet with these ladies on Tuesday. So it's because of Gardner that NASA gains access to the White House. This is a picture of Gardner and Carrie Chapman Catt, NASA president, on one of their many visits to the White House. Gardner becomes a welcome daily presence at the White House throughout Wilson's second term. She's on the phone constantly. She writes daily letters. She meets with the White House officials. And she is the woman who successfully converts President Wilson into a supporter of the 19th Amendment. Again, we can talk more about this and its ramifications during questions. Gardner cultivated such a close relationship with Wilson that she boasted she had asked him for 22 favors and that he immediately granted 21 without question. Meanwhile, Alice Paul and the women of the NWP ramp up their protests outside the White House because they are rebuffed by President Wilson and they have no idea that Gardner has used her rivalry with the NWP to gain access and that Gardner probably at this very same time is inside the White House as these women were protesting outside. Gardner also um, shows us the importance of race and racism in the 19th century, in the 19th Amendment's trajectory through Congress. <clears throat> Soon after Gardner enlists the support of President Wilson for the 19th Amendment, the House voted on it. The House first votes on the 19th Amendment in January of 1918, and it passed. The amendment then immediately went to the Senate. Here, suffragists thought the battle would be pretty easy, that they would get through the Senate by the end of 1918. But they were so wrong. Throughout 1918 into 1919, the Senate would not budge. Suffragists needed to turn just two more votes to get the 19th Amendment through Congress. And they had an incredibly hard time doing so, even with the vocal and active support of President Wilson. Why? Because senators of both parties and from all regions did not want to enfranchise Black women in the South. Here I'm going to give you just one example of the many that I found in my research on Gardner and her correspondence with senators. The first senator that Gardner turned to in an attempt to um, get him to vote yes was her friend John Sharp Williams, Democrat of Mississippi. Many suffragists thought he was the most erudite man in the Senate. He wasn't a virulent racist, at least outspoken like some of his colleagues in the South. And so when they knew they needed to turn at least a couple Southern senators to a yes, they thought they stood a good chance with John Sharp Williams. Helen Hamilton Gardner wrote him immediately after the House passed the 19th Amendment. And she said, hey, Senator Williams, remember that time last year when we celebrated my birthday together? That was so lovely. I say hi to your wife for me. And then she laid into him. She said, did you analyze the House vote? Did you see that the entire Mississippi delegation voted against the 19th Amendment? She said, when this amendment comes before the Senate, I want you to redeem your state. You know as well as I do, she wrote, that the 19th Amendment is coming, that it'll be passed whether or not you vote yes, and that you should be on the right side of history. Make our democratic promise, the promises of the Constitution, real, she says, for your daughters, for your granddaughters, for me. John Sharp Williams immediately wrote his dear friend a letter the very next day, and he said, Helen Hamilton Gardner, if anything in the world could get me to change my no vote to a yes, it would be your letter. And he said, but I could never vote to enfranchise the black women of Mississippi. He told her that he, if he lived in any white state, he would surely vote yes, but not in Mississippi where the black population outnumbered the white. Moreover, he said, black women will almost certainly go to the polls while white women would not. Then he says, and this is the bottom quote, everyone knows he wrote, that the real reason Black men in Mississippi don't vote is not because of the various legal uh, strategies we have used to disenfranchise them, like poll taxes, literacy tests, 
No, he says, the real reason black men in Mississippi don't vote is because they know if they do, some of them will get hurt. But he tells Gardner that this strategy of violence and intimidation won't work against black women because they are women after all. So this is why Williams would not vote yes. And I saw the same arguments about race and about not wanting to enfranchise black women in Mississippi and throughout the South time and time again in correspondence between suffragists and members of Congress and also in congressional statements. And we can talk more about some of these examples in the Q&A. So the thing I wanna point out here and that I want you to remember is that the 19th Amendment did not pass Congress because anyone thought it would enfranchise Black women in the South, it passed Congress because everyone knew it would not. This is a picture of Gardner and her Nassau colleagues at the signing ceremony for the 19th Amendment that Gardner herself orchestrated. She planned this, I believe it was the very first uh, public signing ceremony of its kind. She even bought the fancy gold pen that the Speaker of the House used to sign the amendment before sending it off to the states for ratification. Here she is the next day with the Vice President as he signs on behalf of the Senate. Here is a picture of the fancy gold pen she bought because immediately after the signing ceremony, Gardner turned her attention to suffrage memory. She sent this fancy gold pen to the Smithsonian. Why? Because she wanted the nation to remember the story of the women's rights movement. She wanted the, the Smithsonian to put together a large exhibit on the history of suffrage, showing how vital it was to American history, to American democracy, showing the names and faces of the women who had fought so long for it. Gardner orchestrated the donation of countless artifacts to the Smithsonian, and she worked tirelessly for this exhibit. She was very frustrated when it ended up being a small corner exhibit on a stairwell titled, An Important Epic in History. That is not what Gardner had in mind. That is not how she wanted suffrage to be remembered. And it's not the sort of inroads she wanted women to make into these larger narratives of American history. This was a prime goal, not just of Gardner, but of all her suffrage colleagues. Nassau in 1909 commissioned a study of textbooks to see how women were presented in history and civics textbooks across the country. At the 1910 Nassau Convention, the committee chair reported that history and civics textbooks portray history as if it had been made by men and for men. Sadly, this is still too often the case, as confirmed by a recent study conducted by the National, Mu National Women's History Museum, which found similar results even 100 years later by examining our textbooks and our state standards. Another facet of Gardner's final years is that she became the highest ranking woman in federal government. Her relationship with the Wilson White House was so good and so close that he picked Gardner among all other women to, for this premier post on the Civil Service Commission, which made her a rank just below a cabinet secretary and a national symbol of what it meant finally for white women to be citizens. This is her swearing in, and these were the happiest years of her life her final five years, but she still struggled with this question of memory. How will suffragists be remembered? Whose stories will be told? Whose will be forgotten? So I wanna end here on this picture, which is a picture of Gardner riding her beloved white Andalusian pony, Caillou, uh, through the streets of Washington, where newspapers um, remarked that she cut quite a figure you know, bravely and boldly independently riding her horse around Washington. She later became one of the first women to get her own car. But here she is um, in 1902, and she's posing in front of one of the dozens of statues erected to Civil War generals during her lifetime. And you can see she's modeling the pose of the statue. And I think what she's saying is, where's my statue? When will women's stories be told? When will our nation's narratives be adjusted to center women and women's many contributions to American democracy and American history? And I hope that that's one of the many lessons that we take from the suffrage centennial is that our commemorative narratives, the things we tell about ourselves in museums and textbooks and monuments need to shift 
They need to tell a more nuanced, a more diverse, a more all-encompassing story of who we are as a nation that centers women of all races, of all backgrounds, and their vital contributions to American life, including but not limited to the bold and brave efforts of three generations of women to secure the ratification of the 19th Amendment that we mark today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamlin. Okay, so we have at this stage <clears throat> just one question. Actually, we have several questions um, that just came through. Um, but this first one, um, I think, is a really good one. This is from April. She says, it is evident that Helen Hamilton Gardner was well ahead of her time and made huge strides for women through all of her hard work. Who do you see as one or more of the Helen Hamilton Gardners of our current time? Oh, that's a great question. Well, like so many of us, I um, was so enthused by, invigorated by, excited by all the women, especially the young women who ran for Congress in 2018. So I think that those, uh, the, the freshman class that just entered Congress, one of the most diverse classes, I think the most diverse class in the history of the Congress is really exciting to me. I think the, the leaders of the Me Too movement is another example I would cite as the Helen Hamilton Gardeners of today. Um, so I think there's, there's many positive examples we can point to, and I'm really energized and excited by them. Excellent. Me too. Um, this next question is from Gail. Um, she wants to know, does Helen Hamilton Gardner have a statue or a monument? Um, no, nowhere. No. She has nothing. Um, and so in part, another question that I'm often asked, so I, maybe I'll ask two at once, but sometimes people say, you know, why hasn't her story been told? Why has she been forgotten? Um, so in part, it's because in her will, she mandated that all of her papers be destroyed. And I think it's because of her scandalous personal life. So even though her affair was what catapulted her into public reform work, no one ever knew about it. She had kept up this facade her whole entire life. So in her will, she didn't want to be outed, right? She didn't want everyone to know that she too was a fallen woman who had lived with her lover for 25 years and told everyone he was her husband, but all along he was still married, which she did not know that. Uh, that's a slightly other story, but he also was married the whole entire time that she lived with him. So in part, it's because she didn't leave any papers. Um, so to do this research, I had to go you know, through the other side. Like I had to think, who were her friends, who were her correspondents. So instead of looking at Gardner's papers, I looked at Woodrow Wilson's papers, for example, where Gardner is present more so than any other woman, except for Wilson's wives. She's all over the Woodrow Wilson collection. And the same with, I made a list of all of her friends in the Senate. And then I went to the Library of Congress where most of their papers are. And then I looked at the dates of when the bill, the suffrage, uh, amendment was pending before the Senate. And then I would check those senators' correspondence files. And sure enough, I found her there as well. So in part, um, there's no monuments to her because her story was lost because she didn't leave her papers. But her suffrage colleagues were also really worried about this. So in the you know, 10, 20 years after ratification, suffragists um, in both the National Women's Party and NASA tried time and time again to make sure their stories, their papers, their archives would be saved for posterity. They also published many of their own histories of the movement. Gardner was close friends with this woman, Maud Wood Park, who um, was chair of the Nassau Congressional Committee and then went on to be the founding president of the League of Women Voters. And Maud Wood Park was, besides being a political genius, oh, she also had a secret husband, fun fact, but um, she was a political genius and she was really concerned about suffrage memory. So Maud Wood Park collected all of the materials and donated them to the Schlesinger Library at Radcliffe, where she had gone, which is now a part of Harvard. So she, in the Schlesinger is now, you know, the one of the biggest women's history archives in America. The other one is at Smith. So anyway, the suffragists were really concerned about their memory, their legacy. Maud Wood Park tried valiantly to get Helen Hamilton Gardner's story told because Maud Wood Park said that Gardner was the most potent factor in congressional passage, that they never could have gotten the 19th Amendment through Congress without Gardner. So she tried to get various memorials to Gardner made. Gardner's secretary at the Civil Service Commission, this woman, Rena Smith, 
tried to publish a biography of Gardner, but it got lost in the mail. So there were some attempts to mark Gardner, you know, in the 30s and 40s before her friends and colleagues also died, but these did not uh, come to fruition. So now there are no markers um, or monuments to Gardner. Her grave, she's buried um, at Arlington National Cemetery because Colonel Day, her husband, was a you know military hero. So she has a lovely grave site there. Um, and I've also visited all the houses that she lived in. So that one in Sandusky that I showed the picture of, that's on the Register of National Historic Places, not because of Gardner, but because it's one of the only limestone houses <laughs> um, still intact. And then um, where she lived in New York, uh, which is 162 West 85th um, in the Upper West Side, I'm friends with that building owner now, and he's eager to put some sort of marker on his building, but there is there are currently no um, markers to Gardner. Wow, that's fascinating. Special thanks to Maud Wood Park for yeah. making sure there's some preservation yeah. of her, her legacy. Um, let's see, several other questions have come in. Um, let's see, oh, seeing as all of her, this is from Amy, seeing as all of her papers were destroyed, how do we know that she was a fallen woman? Oh, that's another great question. And here I wanna give a shout out to the public humanities, to our local libraries, because the way that I found out about her fallen woman scandal, because even until I wrote this book, like all of the encyclopedia entries about Gardner, I think probably her Wikipedia, though I haven't checked it recently, all say that she was married to this guy, Charles Smart, and that they got married in 1875. But thanks to the archivists, librarians who have digitized small and local newspapers over the past 10, five years, when you trace Gardner through the papers, you see the sex scandal emerges. So I worked with um, two local history librarians at Cincinnati Public Library to you know, learn about these databases of Ohio newspapers. And that's how we found about the fallen woman scandal. The other um, evidence of it is in the kind of what's more like a traditional social history archive. So the probate records, I followed the probate records of her family basically all of her family dies by 1882. So you can see like who's listed and how they're listed in the wills. Um, and when her mom died in 1882, she's listed in those probate records as Mrs. Charles Smart of Detroit. So she did not ever marry Charles Smart, but obviously that told me she told her parents or her mom that she had married Charles Smart. No, oh, that's interesting. Um, let's see. This question comes from Deb. Um, I think this is a, a valuable question. How might we use the skillful and planful advocacy strategies of Helen Hamilton Gardner in conjunction with protests to move voting rights forward today in today's climate? That's a great question. And so one thing that really strikes me of the differences between Helen Hamilton Gardner's time and our own is the level of access to our elected officials. So one thing that Gardner and her suffrage colleagues enjoyed was access to legislators. So they didn't, until Gardner, they didn't necessarily have the insider access, but still they could send a letter and say, hey, Senator, Congressman, I'm your constituent and I'd like to come meet with you. And they could expect a response and generally even to meet with said man, right? Now, because of many changes involving campaign financing, um, we can no longer, right? I don't, I can't call up Steve Shabbat and say like, hey, I live in Ohio one, you know, I'd like a meeting that would never happen, right? So in part, I think um, to affect some of the sorts of changes, we need more access to our legislators. We need to be able for citizens to hold our elected officials accountable. How does that happen? I think through campaign finance reform and through redistricting to kind of outweigh some of the damage that's been caused by gerrymandering. So that's not a direct answer to your question, but to be able to have some of the influence that Gardner had personally, we need to have access to our legislators. Absolutely. Access means so much for so many reasons. Um, let's see. This next question is from Michelle. Um, what lessons can be applied from Helen Hamilton Gardner's life as we continue to seek universal voting rights for everyone, not just um, women? Yeah. Yeah. That is such a great question. So I wanted to, in today's talk, um, I mentioned that race, you know, is one of the key themes, sex, race, and more to the point, racism and history were our three themes. So I'm really glad that you're asking about this because 
that's one of the key things I want people to take away from my book, Free Thinker, and from this research. And that's the extent to which leaders have gone to to keep African Americans from the polls. So um, in the debates about the 19th Amendment, time and time again, what legislators said was they could not vote for the 19th Amendment because they didn't want to enfranchise Black women in the South. And again, this was not just John Sharp Williams of Mississippi. It was also leaders from New York, from the West, of both parties, Democrats and Republicans. And women suffrage leaders like Gardner capitulated to this. They basically said, that's fine. We don't care about the 15th Amendment, which is the amendment on paper that was supposed to enfranchise Black men. They said, just give us the 19th Amendment. So that's how NASA and the NWP negotiated congressional passage. They assured these male leaders that they wouldn't say a peep about the 15th Amendment, that they wouldn't say a peep about the enforcement of the 19th Amendment in the South, that they just wanted white women basically to be able to vote. So that's what happened. And we can see this again. You might say, how do I know this? Well, you can see this again in the years immediately following ratification in the early 1920s. Many black leaders like Mary Church Terrell, Ida B. Wells, women who had fought violently for the vote through civil rights organizations, through the black church, through black women's clubs, they approached the suffrage leaders like Alice Paul and Maud Wood Park. And they said they were knew them, they were friendly. And they had said, you know what? Isn't it great? We got the 19th Amendment ratified. Hey, Maud Wood Park. Hey, Alice Paul. You guys know that Black women in the South are being disenfranchised just like Black men are through poll taxes, literacy tests, intimidation. Can we work together now in the 1920s to make the 19th Amendment reality for all women? And Maud Wood Park and Alice Paul and the other white leaders basically said, no, that's not our issue. That's a race issue, not a gender issue. So I hope that the suffrage centennial really gives us a, a big wake-up call, a, a big chance to look back at history and the failed attempts of previous generations to work really you know, cohesively together across race, across class, across ethnic divides for the common good. Um, so I hope that is one of our takeaway messages. And just as a small caveat, um, one kind of positive example of this is in those age of consent campaigns that I talked about in part one, there, there are some examples of women working together across race and class lines, largely through the WCTU to raise the age of sexual consent. And Gardner too played a big role in that because um, there's a big parallel between um, Southern states, both in age of consent and, and suffrage. So the same states that refused to raise the age of consent for girls above 12 are the same states that didn't pass or ratify the 19th Amendment, the Southern states. Um, and Gardner, and this is because they didn't want black women to be able to charge white men with a crime. But Gardner in the 1890s spoke out time and again saying that age of consent laws should apply to all women regardless of race because some Southern states, like they later did with the 19th Amendment, tried to inc introduce clauses saying, okay, fine, we'll raise the age of consent, but it should only count for white women. And Gardner fought back unsuccessfully. She lost this battle, but she said, this is you know, bogus. It should be for all women. And then again, you see Southern states doing the exact same thing in the 19th Amendment, where John Sharp Williams, for example, and among others, introduced clauses to the 19th Amendment um, unsuccessfully, but trying to clarify that it should only pertain to white women. Fascinating, so many complexities. Um, I just wanna, we have a couple uh, really good questions that I'd really like to get to, but just to be mindful of everyone's time, I wanna remind the audience that you can view this webinar in its entirety later this afternoon if you need to leave us before we've concluded today. Um, but as I mentioned, we have a couple of really good questions that I'd still like to get to um, before we let you go, Dr. Hamlin. Um, this question comes from Elizabeth. In addition to your book, Free Thinker, what other books might you recommend for people who want to expand their understanding um, of the long fight for women's equality and voting rights? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> this is a really exciting time to be a historian of women and women's rights. So the first I want to recommend to you is a new book coming out next week by Martha Jones. It's called Vanguard, and it tells the stories of the African-American women who fought for the vote before, during, and after uh, the 19th Amendment, because as I mentioned, for African-American women, voting rights did not become a reality to the 1965 Voting Rights Act. So that's a new book I'm super excited about. Um, another book by, is by my friend Kathleen Cahill, who's a historian at Penn State. 
Her book is called Recasting the Vote, and it's a group biography of six women, two African-American women, two Chinese, maybe not six, um, I can't remember how many women, but there's African-American women she profiles. She also profiles Chinese-American women, Native American women, and Hispanic women. So hers is a really great story, again, showing what suffrage meant to different women based on the state they lived in, the race or ethnicity they were, and when they could vote. So that's another book I'm super excited about. One I used um, in my women's history class at Miami last fall that the students really liked. And so if you're looking for like a, a very teachable book, I would recommend to you Susan Ware's Why They Marched. And this is a book, um, Susan Ware is a longtime historian and biographer of women. She's the, suf she's the um, suffrage centennial, centennial historian at the Schlesinger Library. And her book has 19 chapters profiling 19 women and then pairing each woman with an object or artifact at the Schlesinger. So you can see the material, culture, and history of the suffrage movement, as well as learn about 19 fascinating women from all walks of life. So she has an illustrator, a cartoonist, um, you know, a lesbian couple, a woman who rode her horse across Massachusetts, all sorts of women and how they contributed to suffrage are in her book. And the chapters are short, uh, so it's easier for students, I think, to um, have the bandwidth <laughs> to, to read through the class. So that was the one I really liked teaching. Awesome. Thank you for those um, options. Um, let's see, just a couple more. This question comes from Betty. Um, why was Helen Hamilton Gardner excluded from PBS's The Boat? She was not mentioned once. I know. I know. Um, I think in some ways it's timing. So my book wasn't out yet. I know some of my friends, you know, were profiled were some of the talking heads in that documentary. And they told the producers, oh, you have to include Kimberly or, you know, what about Helen Hamilton Gardner? But I think in part it was a timing issue because even among uh, suffrage historians and women's rights historians, Helen Hamilton Gardner is not that well known. Um, you know, snippets about her life have been written, you know, in free thought history, in age of consent history, in suffrage history, but these stories tend to be told discreetly. So a lot of those historians too never knew that the free thought gardener was the sex reform gardener was the suffrage gardener. So um, I think it was, um, it's just not even among historians is her life that well known yet. So I hope that, I hope that we change that. And I hope that she also encourages us to talk, to talk more about the role of sex and the sexual double standard in motivating women to enter uh, political life and also the role of race and racism in the history of the 19th Amendment. Well, we certainly appreciate you shedding a little light on Helen today. Um, and then one last question, it's somewhat speculative, okay. uh, but do you think Helen Hamilton Gardner truly loved Selden Allen Day or was marrying him sort of a calculated move um, based on her political connections and her um, sort of you know, penance for using her address book, if you will? Um, so yes and no. So um, I do not think she really loved him. She really loved Charles Smart, the man she had had the affair with and then lived with for 25 years. Um, and when he died in 1901, I think he died of syphilis and she had to put him in an asylum in Connecticut. And in his deathbed pocket, she found a letter from his daughter indicating that they had been visiting each other the whole entire time. So this causes Gardner to have a huge breakdown. And so she kind of recuperates by going to Puerto Rico to visit Selden Allen Day, who was stationed there. So I don't think she loved him, especially not in the passionate way she loved Charles Smart. But I don't think she married him because of his address book, because in 1902, she had no idea she would later move to Washington and be a suffragist. So she could not have known that she would, you know, how, how helpful it would be to have his address book. Because at the time she was not a member of Nassau. She hadn't ever really given a suffrage speech. So she couldn't have foreseen that. But what I think drew her to him was he was in the army. He had a steady paycheck. He showed up on time. He did what he said he was gonna do. So her lover, Charles Smart, was like constantly getting fired. He got arrested for fraud at a job she got for him. He was always sick. She couldn't count on him to go anywhere or do anything, not even to mention the secret family he had the whole time. So she had gone through so many ups and downs with Charles Smart that I think she was like, oh God, this guy Selden Day like, is where he says he's gonna be. He pays the bills. Um, and so I think that's what appealed to her to him, about him. It was strategic, but not precisely in the strategic way the question asked. <laughs> 
Excellent. Thank you for, for sort of going out on a limb to answer that question. Yeah. So I believe that's all the time we have today. Uh, for those of you who are interested in more information from Dr. Hamlin, um, or continuing the conversation, you can contact her by email at hamlinka at miamioh.edu. You can also follow her on Twitter at Professor Hamlin, or you may visit her website at KimberlyHamlin.com. As a reminder, uh, a recording of this presentation will be available on this website later today. And we thank you again, Dr. Hamlin, for leading this webinar. Um, please be sure to look for her book, Free Thinker, Sex, Suffrage, and the Extraordinary Life of Helen Hamilton Gardner, wherever books are sold. And please check out our other webinar presentations at alumlc.org slash Miami OH. Thank you all for joining us today and love and honor to you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much.